Jeff, don't bite your fingernails. Mr. Chairman, we are live on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to the TRW Travel Recreation Wildlife Committee meeting. Uh, before we go through roll call and introductions, I'd like to recognize the, the members that likely this is going to be their last meeting, I would guess. Uh, I don't know if TRW is going to have another one before or not, uh, unlikely. Uh, Senator Moniz, put a smile on your face. Uh, <laughs> good to see you here this morning. Uh, Senator Insami Dalton, uh, Representative Haley, and Representative Freeman. I think that's the crew. We've taken a big hit off some great committees that have done some phenomenal work. And hats off to all of you and, and a huge thank you for everything. I about got tears in my eyes looking at Glenn sitting there. It's uh, it's been a, been a long run with a lot of good people, and I thank all of you. And then I'd also like to welcome incoming chair, Senator Ellis, and new committee member, Senator Landon. Uh, got, a, got a great travel, recreation, and wildlife committee on both sides coming up, and uh, we're going to do some great things. With that, we'll, we'll start into what's a heavy day. I'm going to tell everybody... Uh, this morning's not quite as bad. This afternoon is going to be a lot of heavy lifting. We're going to try to keep everything as brief and tight as we can. Both the trapping bill and the gaming bills are, are going to be time consuming. They're both somewhat contentious. So let's, let's try to keep everything as tight as we can. Uh, with that, we'll, we'll go into roll call, please. Senator Anselmi Dalton. Here. Senator James. Here. Senator Moniz. Here. Senator Wasserberger. Senator Wasserberger. I thought he was there for a minute. I did see him earlier. Representative Flitner. Wasserberger here. Representative Flitner. Here. Representative Freeman. Thank you for your comment, kind comments, uh, Chairman Driscoll. Representative Haley? Here. Representative Knapp? If you call me, I'm here. Representative Newsom? Here. Representative Tass? Okay, I'm here. Representative Winter? Here. Representative Yin? Excused. Co-Chairman Driscoll? Here. Co-Chairman Miller? Excused. Excused. Uh, and then a huge apology for me, Representative Tass. I skipped over you as one of the leaving ones. I am very sorry about that. I just was whipping through it and I didn't catch you as somebody that I was, I, I'd actually missed that you were leaving. And yeah. new Representative Knapp. Uh, really tickles me to see new members on ahead of time to, to catch catch a run and so welcome to TRW. Uh, does anybody have anything for the greater good before we start into the agenda? Okay, with that, we're gonna move right into littering and state parks. Mary Beth, do we have someone in the waiting room to, on it? Mr. Chairman, I have just admitted uh, Director Westby, Deputy Directors Glenn and Nilan, and Executive Director Schober. Perfect. Uh, welcome, Mr. Nilan. Uh, Director Westby, I don't see him on. I can't find the screens. And uh, Director Schober, uh, we'll let whichever one of you wants to go first. Uh, do a quick overview for us and we'll have a little discussion. Mr. Chairman, uh, committee, hopefully you can hear me at all. Uh, I appreciate uh, the time. Darren Westby, Director of State Parks and Cultural Resources. Uh, on the agenda, we have littering in state parks and uh, I'll tackle this and I know um, Director Schober is on. I see her and she can uh, attest to what's uh, been uh, in her website and in her world as well. But uh, Chairman Driscoll asked me to kind of look into a constituent email, uh, the email 
uh, said there was a lot of uh, littering in the state with the mass amount of people that have come in. And after doing a little bit of research, it wasn't necessarily at a state park. It was at uh, probably more on the federal side or on the, uh, on the unmanaged uh, sites. And so we, uh, he asked me to take a look into uh, what it would look like for a statewide littering um, campaign. And after some discussions with my crew, creative crew, and then also with Director Schober, uh, we realized that we already have kind of a, a program. It's called Why Responsible through the Office of Tourism. Uh, we've had some input into that program as well with uh, what we do out in our system with the motorized with Leave No Trace or tread lightly and in the non-motorized world, the leave no trace. And so, and Director Schober has included those into her, um, her rollout of the program of trying to be responsible when you come to the state, not only when you recreate, but when you're here to be a, a, a tourist as well. And so um, we did, um, I did ask some of my creative people to put together uh, some creative documents and I did send them out to the chairman uh, and uh, LSO, and I'm not sure if they distributed those uh, little mock-ups, but uh, those were sent out. But I, I think it's uh, probably a moot point after further discussion with the director of tourism uh, and with some of the other members within my staff that we're already doing uh, a, a littering campaign and tr just trying to be responsible to the state in our stewardship of the land. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess that's a quick overview of that. And if uh, if you'd like uh, Director Schober to uh, back clean up on that, that'd be great. Thank you, Director Westby. Uh, that'd be helpful. Uh, Director Schober, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. Welcome. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Diane Schober, the Executive Director at the Wyoming Office of Tourism. And yes, as Director Westby referenced, we have a collective campaign under the brand platform of Why Responsibly. It sits well with all of the other tourism marketing components and really focuses on three pillars, um, our communities, our wildlife, and our lands. And it is a platform to help engage with visitors prior to their visit to join us in a pledge to recreate and adventure responsibly when they're here in Wyoming. Uh, we actually ran two paid media campaigns around it this summer and spent uh, right around 120, excuse me, $155,000 on, um, on the total campaign and um, had a great response to it. You'll also see if you go to travelwyoming.com, you can link right to the Why Responsibly platform on that page. And you'll see um, all of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the pillows there, pillars. We also have badges through our social media campaign where consumers can gather these badges but it was a collective effort with the National Forest Service, BLM, State Parks, Wyoming Game and Fish. And um, the National Park Service has contributed um, in some earlier phases of it. We started looking at, along with State Parks, the Tread Lightly. Uh, we looked at Leave No Trace. Uh, the National Park Service has a pledge that they ask consumers to take as they visit um, our national parks. And what we felt was the most appropriate after this collective conversation was to create something that would be more universal for Wyoming. And so when Director Westby and I spoke right before Thanksgiving, um, you know, he had said, this is probably the best way to respond to this. Even if you go through uh, that webpage and read the stories and, and the content on it, you'll see um, there's a PDF um, that, that visitors and consumers can download. And it speaks specifically to taking away all of the trash and the refuse that you come in with, carry it out. So there's already a brand platform in place that addresses this, not just littering, but a wide variety of ways in which we want our visitors and residents to respect um, these, these wild and public lands. Um, and as they're here visiting, or if it's just our residents out recreating. I um, am happy to answer any questions if that helps you, but just wanted to give you perspective that there's already something in place and it was a collective effort, not just with our office, but with several other federal and state agencies. Thank you. Any questions for Director Schober? Senator Meniz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, this is for Darren. How was the Cowboy Up thing used? Was it part of uh, Diane's campaign or how was it used? Mr. Chairman, Senator Moniz, uh, it wasn't used. It, 
Chairman Driscoll asked me if I would just put together some mock-ups of the, the constituent request, and, and that's what that was, just a mock-up of uh, something that could potentially come out of that uh, constituent request. But uh, as Director Schober said, and uh, I kind of alluded to that we're uh, we, we think that the program is already uh, well established in a, a, a littering campaign and just being responsible when you come to the state. Well, thank you. Yeah, Diana, that's well done. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Freeman. Uh, this is for Darren. Are you going to kind of take some of the stuff that they have and incorporate it in your advertising too, or is, are you thinking tourism is doing enough by itself. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Representative Freeman, thanks for that question. Um, we're, we're continuously uh, trying to request that our visitors and our consumers that come into our products uh, recreate responsibly. Uh, as this year, as you can imagine, with the numbers that we saw, uh, it was even probably more of an effort to try to ensure that people recreated responsibly. Uh, I think a lot of our push that we had this year and will probably continue to go on uh, after this is help us keep the parks open uh, by doing your part. Uh, that same campaign that Diane was talking or Director Schober was talking about uh, with uh, the why responsibly, you know, be responsible when you come to the state of Wyoming uh, and those of us that recreate and enjoy what we have to offer. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think one of the challenges that we have as well are the 10 um, rest areas that have been closed by YDOT. Is there any cooperative effort with YDOT um, to have signage or something on the rest areas that ask people to take their trash with them? I'll start, Darren. I know, Director Westby, that you'll add in. Uh, you've been the leader of it, but um, Mr. Chairman and Representative Newsom, there's a, a working group coordinated through uh, the Division of State Parks that includes the Office of Tourism and uh, Department of Transportation, Business Council, uh, that really works together. And these are the kind of things that what we are trying to do is instead of working individually as separate agencies, is bring these common objectives together so that we can all elevate those. And uh, this is definitely something that I've, we've been talking about as a way to uh, spread this messaging amongst agencies and, and along with not just the Department of Tourism and the Division of State Parks, but amongst other agencies as well. Good. Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was just curious what kind of um, enforcement and repercussions you have for people that you catch littering to kind of deter this type of action. Mr. Chairman, Senator James, uh, we have full law enforcement at, in, our, uh, in our park system. And so we can enforce littering uh, ticket and I believe it's $750 fine if, if caught littering. Uh, luckily, um, Mr. Chairman and Senator James this year, uh, with the amount of people that we had, we also implemented a 100% reservation system. So, like I said before, we did not have or did not see a significant um, significant increase in littering. Actually, we saw just the opposite because now we had everybody's names and contact information. So, if they left a campsite um, in disarray or they left trash, we can give them a call and they you, you got you know, an hour to get back here and get it cleaned up before we issue a ticket and a citation. So uh, we have that opportunity with that, but uh, going forward, we might lose some of that if we reduce the amount of uh, reservation systems. Follow up, Senator James. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would you be able to give me, uh, give the committee an estimate of how many citations uh, you gave out either this year and last year? So that way we could see how, um, see how, just see how many you guys were able to give out. And have you guys ever thought about on top of the citations, maybe, uh, maybe giving out maybe community service, having them come back and do cleanup on the, on the state parks or something like that to maybe help out so that way 
it'll kind of reinforce maybe for multiple offenders, maybe not the first time, but if they do it second or third time, because I know we got to probably keep track. So maybe that's something else to think about. Mr. Chairman, Senator James, all good questions. And I, I could get you that uh, information on the on the citations, but I could almost guarantee you it's almost next to nothing uh, this year on the citations issued uh, with uh, littering. Uh, with that, um, our, our entire program that we're trying to get into is not that we don't have the ability to enforce laws. What we tried to do, uh, as Director Schober has been uh, that mentioned, was we try to educate. Uh, and the more we can educate, the less we have to citate. Uh, and so hopefully through education, we have that ability. And so, uh, like I said uh, before, is before we issue that citation, we give the individuals the opportunity to do what's right. Uh, and then hopes that they learn that they don't have to come back and, and clean up. But we do have the ability to contact them. And like I said, have them come back and clean up their campsite before a citation is issued. Uh, and then obviously work through the court systems with the county uh, court system and have them uh, issue either uh, payment or not payment, but uh, community service in lieu of fines. Uh, absolutely is an, is an option that we can look into for sure. Follow up, Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, outside of don't throw your trash on the ground, what else could you possibly educate someone about? Mr. Chairman, Senator James, uh, pretty much all of our laws that we have and rules that we enforce out in the state park system, like uh, a noise curfew, uh, you know, disturbance of the peace, um, things that uh, we uh, have the ability to enforce and, and, and issue citation, we try not to issue as many citations as we possibly could because uh, realistically, people don't come to a state park to uh, get hassled by law enforcement. What, they, what we're trying to do is uh, create a culture of, uh, that you come here to enjoy. Uh, and so if we can educate, um, hopefully we can reduce the number of citations that we have to issue uh, in, in hopes that everybody has a better time and, and a better experience. Further questions? Further questions? Thank all of you very much. Uh, does the committee want to do anything or we will just treat this as informational, it appears to me. So, uh, uh, Representative Winter. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Darren, uh, Director Westby, I, I have a question about the uh, reservation system that is currently in place. Is that correct? You do have one? Mr. Chairman, Representative Winter, that's correct. We do have a reservation system in place. Yes. Uh, my concern is that uh, I've, I understand that you're planning to, to make it a strictly a reservation type of a system where wherein you don't people can't come to the campground and camp unless they already have a reservation is that correct mr chairman representative winner uh we had to go well we didn't have to we chose to get the parks open this year and one of the reasons that we could get them open this year was by creating a reservation only system and so this year we hustled and were able to get our reservation system spun up quick enough to get every one of our campsites on that reservation system in hopes that we could get camping open sooner rather than later. If you remember back in March, uh, when this thing hit, we were just inundated with people from all over the country. And uh, it concerned me and my staff of us, we're not prepared to handle the pandemic as it came into our system. And so we uh, talked to the governor's office and were able to get the camping closed. We were always open to public uh, daily use, but the camping was closed. And so how we got that open was to create the reservation system at 100%. Now, uh, Nick and Dave, who are on the line, our de my deputy directors have been working with staff to create what does that look like for 2021. Uh, I would venture to say that we're not going to be at 100% at all of our parks this, uh, this coming year. Um, so, we're going to reduce that number of how many how many of our campsites are on the reservation system versus how many are first come first serve. So, 
Um, we, we heard some of the comments that we got this year. Uh, however, we were very pleased that we were able to get camping open as quick as we could through the reservation system, but we do see it um, falling back uh, a little bit for next year. Follow up, Representative Hunter. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, I, uh, I applaud you for the effort you made to get the things open, the campgrounds open. Uh, I have a, a real concern about going strictly to reservation system and it sounds like you're not really looking that direction. I think there ought to be some opportunities for residents of Wyoming to go to uh, these various campgrounds and, and uh, on the spur of the moment, if you will. Uh, so I would hope you would consider that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Representative Winter, we, we did hear that. And I know um, just, just to be clear, our reservation system is uh, set up to where if you drive up to a park and you see an empty campsite, you can call the reservation system to see if it's available. So it does act as a first come first serve. Uh, however, you have to go to a third party to ensure that it is not reserved. But uh, we do uh, think that first come first serve has a place in our system. Uh, I also want to just mention that we got a, a lot of response back that people were really appreciative of having the reservation system. And I'm looking at Senator and Salmi Dalton um, who works in uh, the hotel industry as well. And uh, I, I'd love to know how many uh, walk-up sales that they have versus people when they're coming through uh, they already have a reservation on hand or they call on their drive uh, there and get that reservation made. Uh, and so it's along the same system of uh, understanding that when people travel and they hitch up their, their RV and their boat and all their gear, uh, knowing that they have a camp spot when they get to a, a park or a historic site is important to them. And we saw that as a, as a reason for us that we're we're not going to stay at 100%, but we're also probably not going to drop that much lower. We will maintain some level of uh, first come, first serve, but uh, a lot of our visitors and a lot of our constituents that use our system uh, are appreciative of having that amenity of a reservation system, for sure. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you, Chair. Go ahead, Senator Anselmi Dalton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. and. Um... Uh, Director Westby, thank you. I know it's a tricky balance between the fact that the out-of-state people probably spend more sometimes um, when they come in. I understand that that's a factor, but I did have concerns as well um, about the fact that I know you gave like a weak head start to Wyoming people, but I don't know that they were that organized to always do that. And I, I um, echo Representative Winter's concerns, just that we want to make sure our Wyoming people are allowed to, to use the parks. I had a lot of complaints as I, I said, I think in the last meeting from some constituents that they would go and they couldn't get into a campground. And my thought would be maybe that you allocate at least some just to Wyoming people until the day of, but that's something the committee will have to hash out as they go forward. And for our hotel, yeah, we're pretty much, we get a lot of, this summer was weird. I mean, we just got a lot of walk-in day of bookings and uh, some just walked in and some booked it right like maybe 20 minutes out or an hour out. It was a very strange summer. And, you know, obviously through June and beginning of July, it was pretty dead. But, um, you know, thank you. It is, it's been an interesting ride. I'm sure Chairman Driscoll had the same sort of experience as being in, you know, up there in Devil's Tower. It's, it's been an interesting ride. And I just would, I would ask you um, if you could consider maybe trying to give some priority to Wyoming residents. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? I will. Oh, go ahead, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I have a park pass and my family camps a lot. And I believe there's a feature on there, too, for those kind of last minute um, folks that want to get their family out to camp that you can search for what's available. And they actually kind of broadcast that and market those empty lots, if, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Mr. Westby? Mr. Chairman, Senator uh, Ellis, thank you for that comment. Yes, absolutely. And we do have, like I said, the, the walk up. Uh, if you see a campsite available and it's uh, vacant, uh, you can call into the system and, and, and reserve it right on the spot. And we do market uh, on some of those days or weekends that we're seeing some open spaces. We do market uh, to the people that are in the reservation system to remind them, hey, 
we got 10 open camp spots at Seminole State Park. Uh, it's a great weather weekend. Uh, it's a way for us to try to touch our uh, consumers in a more personable way. Absolutely. Thank you for the comment. Follow up, Senator Ellis. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and then I, I think Senator Anselmi Dalton's on to something when she talks about having a priority. And I know this year was unusual. We opened up the reservation system to Wyoming residents first. And as someone who uses those, it was really nice to have a little bit more flexibility to book those spots rather than in prior seasons where you're competing with the Coloradans that are coming up. And so in visiting with a few folks, I understand it, it's not as simple as we'd like to think to give Wyomingites a priority when booking their summer sites. And so, you know, Dr. Uh, Mr. Westby, it's something I'd like to work on, um, but I know there's more to it. So if you wanna discuss it now, great. But if you wanna save that conversation for a future date, that's fine with me too. Sure, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ellis, I'd love to just really touch on it quick. Uh, it is a little bit bigger complex issue because since we are, uh, we get Land and Water Conservation Fund and have for decades, uh, we are required to not charge more than double what we charge an instator and we can't give them any more preference. And so by what we did this year, we were able to get away with it because it was a pandemic emergency and we were able to uh, open it up to instators, uh, you know, three weeks before uh, non-residents. And I was really trying to push uh, going forward to give instators a week um, head start, two weeks head start. Uh, and uh, the, we were told that we could not do that. And so, but we are continuing, uh, Nick and Dave, who again are on, on the call, uh, are working with our staff to try to develop other certain ways to try to give as much, um, much, possibility for instators to have the uh, uh, ability to come camp. And uh, this year was an anomaly. We were full. I mean, we were, we were fuller than we've ever been. We've designed for full and we were there this year. Uh, in recent years, we've never been uh, that full. Uh, and so I would always say that there was always going to be a camp spot for anybody that came uh, to our park. And, and so as much as I'm concerned that people don't have the ability or the right to come camp, which they do, uh, there's always going to be a camp spot available. And with what we're going to be doing in the going into the future, we're going to be developing more campsites. We're going to be developing more campgrounds uh, in hopes that we can really uh, elevate our economic impact and our impact to the state of Wyoming and revenue. And so uh, I, I look forward to working with uh, Senator, uh, uh, you know, Chairman, woman elect uh, Ellis and, and your team, as well as uh, the representative side of the house as well. Um, really uh, what we're trying to do is just elevate our presence in the state of Wyoming and how we can try to help be uh, a, an assistant in our financial situation that we're in. Thank you. Your further comments. I've got just a, a question or so and a comment or two. First, would the, rate split be true if you privatize some of these campgrounds? Would the privatized campground have to follow the fish and wildlife rules that you're under? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe they would. Um, I, I would have to look into that, but uh, that'll be one note that we'll check into. Okay, thank you. And then just general comments to what you deal with. We dealt with something similar. Senator and Sami Dalton led into that. We were full for 90 days straight at our campground, which has never happened. And daily we have people pull up. There'll be a hundred empty campsites at noon on our campground of people waiting to check in. And people are absolutely livid because they can sit in the parking lot, same as driving by one at the park, and they can't rent a campsite from you because they see an empty one, they think it's a vacant. The reservation systems are incredible. I, you know, we're, we're already full for two or three days for next year on our campground to give you a hint. I think this capacity problem is probably going to continue into next year for you. And that does lead to frustrations, not only amongst non-residents, but I think amongst residents as we get more use, the frustration that we just don't have the capacity to handle all the people all the time is going to be there. So. Uh, I've got great feelings and compunction for what you do, and I thank you guys. I hope you can generate enough revenue to keep expanding your facilities to handle more and more. So uh, 
with that, if there's no further comments, we'll, we have one person with public comment to go. Can we let them in, Mary Beth? Mr. Chairman, I have just um, admitted Lisa Robertson. Uh, I believe she would like to uh, make public comment on this topic. Perfect. Welcome, Ms. Robertson. still muted so do you unmute her Mary Beth or does she have to unmute herself Mr. Chairman I have uh, requested that she unmute and turn on her video okay perfect there she is hello Mrs. Robinson thank you Robertson excuse me Oh, uh, you're still muted. There we go. I'm sorry. I did have a comment and a couple questions. Do you but unmute I, Mary Beth, or does she have to unmute herself? I'm, I'm unmuted. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, requested that she unmute and turn on her video. Okay, perfect. There she is. Yeah. Hello, Mrs. Robinson. Thank you. Move off. We can hear it in the background. <laughs> Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Hi, Chairman Driscoll. I'm sorry. Me. I had a... I had a couple sorry, questions. I did have a comment and a couple questions. Yeah. I'm, I'm unmuted. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, requested that she unmute and turn on her video. Okay, perfect. Ms. Robertson, we're catching your YouTube in the background, I believe. If you've got YouTube on, if you can mute it. That's right. I'm sorry. I did have that on. Um, now I've lost you all. I have both of those on my computer. Is that good? But That's great. Um, I was going to make a statement, but, um, and you know what it was, it's probably, it was about trapping, but I think that's some, some questions. I was worried about litter on the state parks and about littering. And part of that littering was um, there are trapping is it is allowed on state parks with written permission from the state and from the commission. And I don't know if um, you have addressed that, if, um, we don't. It's off topic for this morning. We'll, we'll go to traffic. Right. Okay. For right now, we were kind of on littering and we did wander into our reservation system pretty deep. So uh, I am guessing we can invite uh, uh, Director Westby to come back and comment during the traffic section if, if that works. Do you have time? Director that would Westby? be a good idea. Thank you very much, Chairman Driscoll. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. With that, I think we're we're closed on comments. Does anybody from the committee want to take any action or we'll just move on to the next step? Hearing none, we will uh, do it. Thank all of you very much for your testimony. It was great. It's wonderful to find that we've got good programs that are effective there. No sense reinventing the wheel. So with that, uh, we'll be back to Director Westby or potentially uh, Mr. Nalon on the RFPs in the state parks. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you again, Darren Westby, Director of State Parks. Uh, I'd like to introduce Nick Nalen uh, and Dave Glenn's on, but I think we're going to hand it off to Nick Nalen to go up with the RFP uh, update. So thank you, Mr. Nalen. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, uh, Mr. Co-Chairman Committee. <clears throat> My name is Nick Nalen. I'm a Deputy Director with State Parks. Uh, if I could, uh, very briefly, before I discuss RFPs, uh, address Senator James' question. Uh, in, a, in a typical year, we issue less than a dozen uh, citations and written warnings for littering in state parks. So it is a very, very small problem. In fact, year to date, we've issued one citation and six written warnings. So uh, uh, regarding the RFPs, uh, as you know, we issued the RFP is to run the, uh, to purchase and run the Star Plunge and the Days Inn at Hot Springs State Park in July. Uh, those were due to be submitted to us in October. We received one RFP to run the Star Plunge, the water park uh, at Hot Springs. Uh, we uh, have reviewed that. We put together a review committee. We reviewed it and we've issued an intent to award uh, to the current owner of the facility. 
Uh, that's not a commitment on our part. What that is, is us acknowledging that, that uh, he is the uh, only bidder who is qualified and uh, that we are uh, uh, ready to negotiate with him. We have sent, uh, sent him some proposed changes to the contract from uh, what he submitted to us and we're waiting to hear back on that. We did not receive any RFPs uh, for the uh, days in. Uh, we had uh, several people express interest, but in the end, uh, no one, including the current owner, uh, submitted an RFP. Uh, so what we are doing, we're moving forward with a short-term management agreement uh, we submitted a four-year management agreement uh, to the current owner uh, who is operating right now under a management agreement with us. Uh, we hope to not go the full four years on that management agreement, but it's in place if we need it. Um, as you're aware, we're currently waiting to see what happens with the capital construction bill uh, to see if that uh, frees up any money for us to purchase the days in ourselves uh, and then enter into a management agreement with somebody else to run it long-term, hopefully. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions from the committee? Senator Menees, are you trying to reach for a question? I am, thank you. <clears throat> uh, uh, Mr. Nalen, what, what is the appraised value of, of the days in? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair and Senator, the appraised value, I believe, was $2.25 million. And, is that, and have you submitted your, that budget and that purchase to the, to the Appropriations Committee, or is it part of the, the uh, capital construction bill? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, Senator, the, uh, the uh, Joint Appropriations Committee last year uh, specified that $3 million of our capital construction request was to be set aside for potential purchase of the days in. Okay, and then the star plunge, uh, <clears throat> refresh my memory of no, but let's say the star plunge uh, chooses not to submit an RFP as, as the days in did. Uh, and he is the owner of the facility. What do you do then? Mr. Co-Chair, Senator, uh, in, in that, had that been the case, we would have uh, entered into a short-term management agreement uh, while we looked at uh, putting out another RFP, I imagine. But it's not the case because he did submit uh, an RFP. So back to the days in. What happens if you don't get the money to buy it and the manager of the days in chooses not to submit an RFP or doesn't agree to your temporary agreement, then what? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, Senator, the uh, temporary agreement that we've sent the uh, folks who run the days in is exactly the same as the agreement they're operating underneath now. And uh, we don't have any indication, except for the time frame, and we don't have any indication that they won't accept it. But uh, if the capital construction bill uh, does not provide that we go ahead and purchase the days in, I would imagine that we would go back out to RFP again. Uh, an adjusted RFP in an attempt to try to find someone to run the facility for us. Okay, thank you. Representative Freeman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you have the reserves to purchase that uh, with your own budget without going through? It still has to be approved by the legislature, but just curious. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, Representative Freeman, yes, we do. Representative Flintner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Nalen, can you give a, your opinion as to why there's no interest? Um, Mr. Co-Chair, Representative Flintner, um, I, 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 I believe that uh, uh, that would be a dangerous thing for me to do. I'd, I'd prefer not to give my opinion. <laughs> I, uh, I think that uh, part, of the, part of the concern that we had from people who expressed some interest was that they uh, were, would have to purchase the facilities up front and then invest quite a bit of money to get them up to standards that they would like to see them at over a long period of time. Uh, and that's coming from people who expressed you know, some interest, not, not my personal opinion. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. I'm just, 
please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just wondering if we need to maybe modify our expectations. I just, when I think about myself, our business personally, in the the agreement that we have with our, our federal partners, the Forest Service and the BLM, say for instance, we've got a fence that has to be put up. They buy the materials and we do the labor. And I'm wondering how much, um, what's that relationship? What's that percentage relationship between the state and between those private concessionaires? Mr. Co-Chair, Representative, uh, regarding uh, uh, investments and repairs in the facilities? Mr. Chairman, yes, I'm just wondering, I mean, are we expecting too much of somebody um, to invest in an asset that they have really no control over or no ownership in? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, Representative Flitner, the, uh, the uh, Star Plunge and the Days In, uh, the, the folks who own those businesses own those businesses, and they uh, have had very generous uh, uh, agreements with the state in the past. Uh, up until recently, we were only getting uh, $9,000 a year in rent uh, for the, to operate the Days In. Um, the agreements that we have in place with the, uh, the agreement we have in place, for example, with TP pool, um, requires them to only pay, uh, pay us a half a percent, uh, of their gross revenues per year and for them to take another two and a half percent and reinvest it in the facility. So we're, we're not, we're not looking to make, we have not historically looked to make a ton of money on these properties, what we've looked to do is to try to find ways to help those owners reinvest in their own properties and make them better. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions, committee? Yeah. Representative Tass. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, I'm i gonna go back where I've been for quite a long time. I think this is totally wrong for the state to move in and try to own private businesses. This is not a place, especially with our state financial position, to be uh, crowding these people out of the out of their businesses and taken over. And by them, over the last two years that I've been there, uh, been here on, on this committee, I hear uh, they've been issuing these folks 30-day uh, lease agreements, and that they uh, have these short-term leases. There's no way they can afford to change a light bulb if they are afraid they're gonna get kicked out of their own business within 30, 60 days. Uh, uh, I think they, the department, uh, the uh, uh, Parks Commission has is succeeding. And what I, I saw uh, over the last two years that they have had a conscious effort to take over those businesses and move them out. And, uh, it's been subtle maybe, but uh, they have been crowding those folks uh, to, they got to do this, got to replace, uh, uh, maintain their businesses. And then on the other hand, oh, but uh, we only give you a, a short-term lease. Uh, I, uh, I'm on my way out. So this is my last, uh, last meeting, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's the wrong place for the state to be. Uh, those folks, uh, those concessionaires cannot afford to maintain and do anything with their businesses, their properties on a short lease. Uh, say, well, we'll give them five years. Uh, five years comes and goes really fast in a business. Uh, you can't make a major uh, improvement uh, replacing the carpet or doing anything that if you're only looking at uh, five, you know, short-term leases. They, they should be looking at much longer leases and allow a private enterprise to do the, the good work that they do. So uh, just my observation. And uh, I, I really think that the department needs to back off, uh, come up with uh, longer term uh, leases. Uh, and yes, they, they need to make improvements if they're gonna have a 20 year lease. But, uh, and then be able to uh, say, if you don't do, this is what we expect. And if you don't maintain it, uh, Forest Service, I run on the National Forest up there. I've got, they give us 10 year leases, but 
with that, there are stringents that the, hey, the grass, we got to go out there and measure the grass. We've got to go and maintain the fence. And we do that, but we know that if I make an investment in uh, replacing a cross fence, uh, spending the, the labor or whatever to do that, that I satisfy uh, their request and then I have a long-term lease. And uh, I really sympathize with those concessionaires uh, trying to operate and survive not knowing what in the world uh, is going to be the next thing next month or, you know, six months down the road. So uh, I wish they would back off and, and reconsider uh, some longer leases. So thank you very much. I'll crowd over a little. Representative Freeman, I'll get to you in just a second. I'm going to go ahead and, and answer just a little of that to Representative Tass also, so that the agency doesn't get stuck in the middle of this. I, I've got a pretty good interest in this. Both of those leases were 30 and 40, 40 year leases to give you an idea of what had happened in the past. And they could not reach terms, the same as you with the Forest Service with the state. And it led to where they got at. A bill that we passed a, a year ago made it where those leases had to be long term leases. They can't continue on short term leases, Representative Tass. As far as the day's end goes, and I'm hoping I don't step on the owner's toes. But he basically has made it aware that he no longer, nor his group, wants to own the day's in. They would like to be bought out or to have a long-term RFP give them fair price and take them out on it. And what has happened is no one bid on that RFP, so they're back to the planning board. And uh, I can tell you, at least for the day's in, uh, I'm in contact with the ownership there, whether it's right or wrong as a committee chair. And I understand what they want and what they do. And they've tried very hard to find a way for either the state or someone else to have that facility going forward. So there's been a lot of effort put here. Uh, I have not visited with uh, Roland, the owner and his family owner of the Star Plunge, but where they submitted an RFP and are on the road to what is probably a longer term lease, I'd have to look. Uh, I got to believe that we're on the road to going to the right place on this. There, some of the right things have happened. And at least for me from the outside, it appears we're going down the right path. And I, I thank the state parks for all the effort they've done. I know it's been painful and same for the business owners in the park. It's been stressful and tough for them. And the truth is they're a hybrid. They aren't a true business owner. The state owns the ground under them. Uh, I've operated some businesses run the same way and it makes it really tough when you own a facility that sits on someone else's property. So that's my two cents. We'll go on to more comments from the committee. Senator Insami Dalton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a hotel owner, um, you know, similar different situation than yours, obviously. You know, it's difficult. $2.25 million, if you buy into that, you're basically buying to tear that property down. I mean, when we started to remodel our original site of our building, it's a decision of, you know, to stay a Holiday Inn. I mean, Days Inn probably has lesser standards, obviously, that used to be a Holiday Inn, but to stay a Holiday Inn, you know, they have specs that they want done and they want it. They want new carpet, they want new paint, they want new everything. I mean, it's it gets to be outrageously expensive and, and difficult. So I, as a business owner, wouldn't come in, even though it's a very desirable place to be and it could be a real winner, to pay 2.25 million to basically purchase a property that you, I would say I'd want torn down to start fresh and new. Cause it's, you can't make the rooms bigger. You can't make the hallways bigger. You can't make it, you know, they have older elevators. I've been in that hotel. I'm sure you have two representative tasks. And I agree with you. I don't like um, government competing with private businesses, but being on a land like that, I don't know how much land there is to buy it for 2.25 million, but especially in COVID times, I could see why the RFP failed um, this year. No one would want to buy a hotel this year. You know, it was a loss of, you know, over a million dollars during the March, uh, April, May, June period um, in the hotel business. And so I don't know if it's a better thing to put the RFP out again. And I would, that's why I was going to question uh, the director or, or Nick and to ask them, are they going to put the RFP out again? How much land is there uh, on that? I mean, I know it's a lease and what was it? I can't remember what the amount that you were released before. I know before it was $9,000, but what's the amount of the lease and how much land is there? And 
what are we going to do with that property if we buy it at the state level? Are we going to tear it down and then put it out for RFP again? I, I just, what is the plan now? Because it's hard to, to deal with old. Thank you. Mr. Co-Chair, Senator, uh, what, what, our, what our plan is, is to enter into the, uh, enter into another management agreement with current owners uh, and uh, hopefully uh, negotiate a purchase if the capital construction uh, bill passes. If, if, uh, if that doesn't pass, uh, we will probably go back again, go back out to an RFP. The, the uh, current owners of the days in decided not to submit because they are aware of this capital construction bill and the potential for the state to buy it outright. Had that not been the case, I believe they would have submitted an RFP and entered into a long-term lease with us and then sold the property to somebody else, which as co-chairman Driscoll said, is, uh, is their stated intent. They want to get out of the business. Uh, I, I, I believe that we, we have heard from uh, the current owner uh, and uh, brought in uh, uh, someone who, a uh, consultant, if you will, someone who owns other facilities in the state and their opinion was that we uh, would probably be better off tearing the, the hotel down and starting from scratch again as well. So I, I think that you, you're on the right track. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Nick, if we buy it for 2.5 million, how much is it gonna be tear it down? Is, are there asbestos issues? That property's old. I mean, I'm just saying, I had just a little bit of asbestos in the restaurant and that was not a cheap little fix for that piece. And that was only on one small wall. So I'm just asking, I mean, we buy this albatross and then we go and tear it down so that some other person, so then the winner gets it. And how's that RFP gonna go? I mean, I, I'd be happy to come in after you tear it down and the albatross is gone and build a sparkly new property in a spot where you're gonna have plenty of tourists, but is it really the state's job to spend 2.25 million? And then how much? That's the question. What's the cost to tear that building down considering that I bet you it has asbestos in it. Have you guys looked at that? Well, Mr. Co-Chair, uh, Senator, uh, so we're, we are, we are, we, we have not necessarily committed to tearing the building down. Uh, if the right person comes in and is interested in spending the money to renovate it, uh, we believe that that's still possible, although unlikely, agreed. The, uh, I, I do not know enough about the history of the building to know if there are any asbestos issues, maybe uh, the engineer uh, on the call, uh, Director Westby, might have some uh, ideas about that. Follow, well, Mr. Chair. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you should find out if there's asbestos there. I've, I'm guaranteeing you that there probably is. I can't imagine that building is, is older. And it's a lot to renovate something like that. That is not a cheap prospect. If you're going to pay $2.25 million to buy into a renovation scheme, uh, I just wonder... You know, it's no surprise to me that you didn't get a bidder on it. Um, I'm, I would bid on if it was reasonable, but that's not a bid I'd want to take on and manage. So I think you should find out, and I think you should get back to this committee and let them know before this happens of what the, if there is asbestos and what that price will be then to tear that down. And I'm just letting the committee know as a hotelier, it's, it's not so much fun when you're dealing with older buildings and new construction and trying to remodel stuff. If you remodel it too much and you have to put in sprinklers, I'm sure it's not sprinkled. That was a million dollars for me this, this last, last fall and year. And that was no party. I finally finished it a year later. So just take caution, please. Thank you. Mr. Co-Chair, Senator, we will follow up and get you that information. Representative Freeman, I ditched you really bad. Did you still have a question? And I apologize. That's fine, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I learned a lot just on that, that last exchange, but uh, I, I just, the state has a responsibility to, to make sure that they, they promote the resource uh, that they were given. Um, I, um, as a child, I went to a hot springs about every month. My, um, my dad would put us in the, in the camper and bring us to this hot springs. And as a child, it was a magical place. And um, so when I got married, we needed a place close by to, uh, uh, to, to have our honeymoon. So I thought, let's go back to this magical place. So we went back to this hot springs and uh, we showed up to go to the, um, to the facilities and it was abandoned with the hot water that was going through. And we asked the motel owner what happened and they said that 
Well, the people that were running it considered it as a cash cow and they didn't update it and pretty soon nobody came. And I understand where Representative Tass comes from and I agree with him, but the state has an obligation to make sure that that place is marketable and that they're bringing the upkeep. And I do not uh, envy the, the department at all to, to, to have that fine balance of promoting that, that business and, and preserving the resource. Because if they don't preserve, if they don't upkeep the business, the resource goes to, uh, to pot, so to speak. Uh, a uh, an idea of, to increase revenue, uh, but um, you know, I I think that uh, the department's doing a good job. I don't I don't envy them. And from the um, exchange that comes up there before, I really don't like the idea of the state spending two point two five million dollars to tear down a property on their own property and, and not go anywhere with it. If anything we can do is we can put more uh, more hot water over the terrace and bring back the um, the uh, terrace to where it looks nicer. But uh, that's a pretty hefty price. Thank you for letting me make a comment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Further questions? Further questions? Very good. Thank you very much for the update. This has been a 20-year ongoing topic. Hopefully someday it gets finished. We're I'm, I'm glad to see the first leg with the star moving down the road, at least we're down to one. So thank you all for your efforts. And I know how difficult it's been. Uh, do we have any public comments on Hot Springs, Mary Beth? Mr. Chairman, there is no public comment on this topic. Very good. With that, we are closed on that. Uh, wildlife rendering is not scheduled till 1030. I think we'll take a 10 minute break and uh, let's come back at, uh, let's do 15, 945 and we'll go ahead and go into rendering. I think it's a mild enough topic that we can go ahead and do it a little ahead of time. So we'll, everybody wants to shut off their audio and their video and we'll come back in at uh, 945. Thank you.
Hi, Dave Miller. Hey, good morning. Good morning. How you been? Good, good. Well, where are we on the agenda? We're going to go, we just finished um, the Hot Springs Park, Chairman Miller, and um, I wanted to let you know that I, Mike Yin is not here today. I assume he, Chairman Driscoll knows this because he is um, flying to Atlanta. His dad has COVID and he said he, he had taken a turn last night for the worst, but today better maybe, so hopefully so, but I just want to give you that information. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry to hear that. Right. I, think I, saw, I think I saw an email on that. Yeah, poor guy. Well, it's uh, one thing, uh, we lost one of our committee members, so uh, something to be real serious and concerned about. Right, I just hope his dad's okay. Poor guy, it'd be an awful thing to be on a plane worrying. So, yeah, sad. Well, we need to keep him in our prayers so he doesn't get sick himself. Yeah, right. For all of us, we just have to be careful with things. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure people were aware and just because I'm thinking of him today myself and hope we all do. Chairman Miller, can you give us as much as you, how is Senator Bebop doing? You know, I, I haven't heard, uh, what, what, what have you heard so far on him? Just looked pretty weak and it, it's hit him pretty hard. Okay, anyone else in his family involved in that or, or what? Not that I know of, and I haven't called him. I tried calling him a few days ago, and he's back in Riverton now. Oh, okay, okay. He's Every not in the hospital. The Gropes call yesterday. He, he hasn't, uh, yeah, I saw he wasn't on appropriations uh, today, so uh, was wondering what was going on. He has COVID. Boy, it's, I, guess it, we're all, I guess we're all going to get it sooner or later. It's tough. We're, we're all getting where we know people that have got it. Uh, well, it hit this committee home. That was I. I actually should have started the meeting with a prayer for the family of Representative Edwards because that is absolutely tragic. What? Yeah, it hit really close to us, and uh, yeah, we all uh, enjoyed Roy and his comments, and uh, we feel so bad uh, for him and his family, and uh, we just have to all be careful. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there was a more principled representative than Representative Edwards. You could agree or disagree with him, but you didn't have to spend a whole lot of time thinking whether you're going to move him from one position to another because his principles were right equal to bedrock. Yeah, absolutely. He, uh, I don't think he got bothered by lobbyists uh, too much because uh, he was rock solid in his convictions. Yep. No, I, you got to respect the guy whether you whether you agreed with him or disagreed with him politically, he, he was a purist in the way he went about doing le legislative work. And I always respected, admired it. And he was always friendly, regardless of where you were at. The guy was always, uh, always good to you on it, regardless if you were in the throes of a battle. He, he was a gentleman. Yep. So, it's been hard on me. I've, I've watched this stuff. I'm, been really hard to watch the the different sides of this as we go through it whether it's real or not whether you do things or what you don't do it is unbelievable um, yeah i i don't i don't know what to think about it you know it, it you just go about your life but be careful and uh wash your hands and wear the mask when you're around other people but uh you know i don't know what else to do are we on youtube mary beth Mr. Chairman, we are on YouTube. Okay, that's fine. I just so everyone was aware this is not a backroom committee conversation. We are live on it. It's definitely no fun having this COVID. How's your wife? It's kind of hard now. Senator Perkins, President Perkins, is 
uh, sounds like two to three months recovery time for him. And wow, it's it's not for the weak of heart. Yeah. So did, did Perkins go to the hospital? He did. He spent multiple days, and he is still on oxygen. I hope he's all right with me talking about him, but he is he is on oxygen, and they're telling him months recovery, not days. Well, besides uh, Eli and, and Perkins, is there any others that, that have it right now? Uh, Barlow has had it and been over it. Um, Want to say there was a couple others I'd heard of that have had it. So it's well, well Jim, Jim, uh, representing back, you you kind of had it first, didn't you? Yeah, in March. And and your wife also, right? Yeah, then Judy got it. Yeah, Judy and, got it. And, uh, you guys are a hundred percent now, right? No, we still have residual. I still have a cough. You know, Judy can't catch her breath. It's like it's all in the lungs now. Oh, my. And we're both just tired all the time. I could sleep 10 hours and get up, and it's like I've never been to bed. Wow. Senator Anderson has it as well. <laughs> wow. And there right. may be others I don't know. You know, uh, Senator Bebout, I just found out a couple of days ago about it. Apparently, it's been a while with him, and I... I just didn't know. Was he down in Arizona with it or, or what? I believe he was. I, I hate to publicly say much, but I, I think he flew up to, to be here with it. So. Huh. Okay. Well, I'll check on him too. So. Hey, I, I want to congratulate Representative Flitner. She's going to be the new house chair in uh, TRW. So, uh, Congratulations, Representative, and uh, be ready to uh, go go uh, forth uh, as a practice this afternoon. We have both chairs. We have Senator Ellis and Gummy Chair on the Senate side as well. So, congratulations, uh, Senator. Two two fine ladies, and actually, you've been gifted with, in my opinion, absolutely wonderful committees coming in. TRWs should be a joy going forward. I looked at the committees and. Uh, I, I think it's going to be fun for you. I'm going to turn this over to Co-Chairman Miller for the rendering, and uh, we'll we'll go on from there. And then I also may leave at 1.30. I also have natural resources funding at 1.30, and I may step off for a bit for that as well, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, I'm I'm uh, since uh, since we've lost our Vice Chairman uh, Roy, uh, I, I'm hoping Representative Flitner will will step in there and go ahead and. Uh, assume command of the, of the meeting and move forward if she so desires. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you sure you don't want to just uh, finish out your swan song here today? No, no, no. I, I, I want to, I want to, I want to be back in the peanut gallery. <laughs> oh, golly. You know, af after uh, uh, Senator Driscoll and myself, we were, we were uh, so easy and such easy people to get along with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried about the committee with uh, Representative Flitner and Senator Ellis taking over. You guys are pretty tough and uh, you're, you're going to bring uh, bring everyone to heel uh, to, to your uh, to your liking. So uh, anyway, congratulations to both of you. I think it's great that uh, you went from the, the two, uh, uh, you know, Neanderthals uh, committee chairman to two beautiful ladies uh, to be committee chairman. So uh Congratulations to both of you. I'll second that, and I'm going to request Senator James give them grief this afternoon just so they know how to do it. <laughs> so, so, Representative Flitner, please, please, uh, please go forward on the agenda. Oh, okay. Well, <clears throat> nothing like hunting here. Next on the agenda is wildlife rend rendering. Representative Wharf, good to see you. It's good to be with you. Well, pr please proceed. I guess you're you're up. Well, uh, you, you have before you a bill that uh, I had a constituent that came to me and uh, was desirous of getting something in statute uh, that would allow him to expand his business. So uh, we, we worked on this issue. We, we talked with... Uh, some of the folks down in the state of Utah, uh, they, they were somewhat helpful, but, but really uh, 
we owe a lot of this to our fine LSO staff. They're the ones that actually came up with the verbiage that you see before you. But, but this really is, uh, it, it, it deals with the question that, you know, the Game and Fish said that they could do it all through rules and regs. Uh, but he was a little reluctant to, to leave it to that process uh, because th there was a lot of questions, a lot of ambiguity in, in the definition. Uh, and, and what you may have seen as unusable portions of game, someone else may not have, but it's really hard. There's, there's not a very good definition, but we all know, you know, when, once you've taken an animal and you, you've tried to get as much meat off the bones as you can, there still is meat that remains. And so that's what we tried to do with this bill is to, to add a little more clarity uh, that, that those remains could, in fact, even though they're usable portions of meat, could be used for rendering. So th this is uh, nothing more than to try to to, to add clarity uh, to the law so that this business could be expanded, so. So Mr. Worf, how great a need do you think there is for this? Well, uh, I think if you look at somebody that's got a business and, and, and they, they want to expand that business, if, if it were left just to be put in rules and regulations, they're, they're still going to be asked to put all this money and capital into expanding their business and somebody could come in on a whim and shut it down. So that's what we were trying to do is set something up in statute that gave them the comfort to, to move forward with expanding their business. And th this will take him uh, right now. He has a meat processing here in, in Evanston that uh, allows him to, to cut game meat, but you know that, that's very seasonal. And with him being able to do rendering, it, it, it will expand uh, the, the amount of time that he can run that business. Uh, you know, it, 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 and I don't know if he's on, uh, I know uh, I, I had invited him to come as well, but you know, that, that's the whole idea is uh, to give him the ability to, to expand his business from only being open for three or four months out of the year to, to hopefully being open more year round. Uh, that, that allows him to continue to employ uh, people in our community. And, you know, it, it, it just creates a new product that, that he could be producing, so. Okay, thank you. Does anybody, before we have LSO walk us through, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Worf? Mary Beth, are you there? I sure am. Would you mind walking us through the bill? Actually, uh, John Brody will walk you through the bill. Okay. Hi, John. Uh, hello, Madam Chairman, or Chairman-elect, I guess. Um, I'm not sure what the proper term is. Uh, John Brody, Legislative Service Office. Um, as Representative-elect Worf alluded to, um, this bill sort of just clarifies um, in Wyoming statute that the use of inedible portions as we define it in the bill and um, allow for the game and fish to further define. Um, the bill makes it clear that those inedible portions of a processed animal can be used, um, sold, bought, bartered, um, you know, in, in commerce in the state. Um, as far as kind of the bill itself, there, there's really not a whole lot to it. As you can see on page two, um, that really is uh, the gist of the bill. Um, 233302, we've just turned into two subsections. Uh, the subsection A is the portion of the statute that already exists. Um, for consistency purposes, we've added wild bison into that sort of, I guess, generic prohibition that this statute generally was, uh, just to make it clear that wild bison are also kind of part of the, the general approach when it comes to the regulation of these, these animals. And then subsection B um, really is the, the, the guts of the bill. And um, it basically just allows for the sale of inedible portions. We define the inedible or inedible, inedible portions as um, all the remaining parts after the processing of the animal and subject to further definition by the Wyoming Game and Fish. Um, this, this language is included in the bill um, mostly for uh, chronic wasting disease concerns and other sort of um, uh, maybe disease 
problems that Game and Fish is, is, is always wrestling with and allows them the regulatory flexibility to adapt um, when it comes to those sorts of issues that, that are present and you know, new ones could arise. The other uh, maybe notable portion um, is that the animal has to have been taken by a license big game uh, by a license um, for the big game animal. Um, the purpose of that was to make it clear that um, roadkill does not fall under um, the authority that's being granted under this bill. There was concern um, in conversations I had with Game and Fish um, about creating an ambiguity where someone would try to uh, harvest um, roadkill from the side of Wyoming's roadways and then try to use that animal and sell um, inedible portions of that animal. So that's why that's in there as well. And um, that's about the gist of the bill and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Committee, questions for Mr. Brody? Committee, what is your pleasure? Uh, Mr. Co-Chairman Driscoll. Uh, do we have a game and fish rep here? I, uh, Madam Chairman, I guess to me, I've got 70 to 100 dead deer laying along the road on my place that I would be absolutely thrilled to have somebody come pick up and render. And I, I guess I have a, a question of why we don't allow people to pick up the dead ones on the road being as why dot nor the game and fish pick them up. I, I literally have a hundred dead deer laying along my place. Uh, Mr. King, I see you've jumped on. Do you have a response to Chairman Driscoll? Yes, uh, Representative Flitner, uh, Chairman Driscoll, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Thanks. So our, our primary concern with roadkill again is chronic wasting disease, uh, making sure that, uh, that, that those parts of deer, specifically the, the brain and spinal column, end up in a landfill versus being transported across the state or, or out of state. So chronic wasting disease is, is the biggest concern for uh, roadkill carcasses. Representative, oh, follow up, Mr. Chairman. What makes them better laying in the ditch along my place than telling somebody to take this brain and spinal column out? Do it, I guess to me, I think they're a problem where they're at right now. And I'm a little, little humped up over it that we can't even let somebody pick those up out of the ditch. And, uh, you know, they aren't even going to a pit now. And we know, I get the CWD, we have it. And it comes through the grass when they lay there in the ditch and die or get hit. And cattle trailing down the ditch graze that grass, that grass has CWD in it. And I think we need to do everything we can to, to find a way to, to relieve all we can of this. And that, I guess to me, what, what's wrong with letting somebody render it? Tell them to cut the head off and strip the spinal cord on it. Mr. King. Sure, uh, Representative Flitner, Chairman Driscoll. So one thing that um, uh, should be addressed is YDOT does have some uh, responsibility for some statutory responsibility for carcasses in the roadway. And I, I don't have that statute pulled up in front of me, so I can't read the specifics, but that is one thing that we'd have to um, look at. And then in past discussions uh, regarding possession of roadkill, um, there would need to be some uh, provisions so that a person, if they did pick up those carcasses, could legally possess them. So, you know, right now, if you pick up a, um, or if, if you were in possession of a carcass, you would need some sort of proof that you have it legally. So some of the discussions that have occurred in the past regarding roadkill have centered on centered um, around the, the need for providing a mechanism for a person to legally possess that. And as I recall, uh, some of those discussions centered, up, centered around uh, some of the workload involved in making sure that those provisions could be addressed by the department. So those are, those are just two, two other considerations to take into account regarding uh, roadkill. Thank you, Representative Tass. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam uh, Chairman. Uh, we had this discussion here not that long ago uh, about the rendering of, of uh, these unedible parts, the uh, 
uh, nerve tissue, spinal column, brain, and whatever. And taking that uh, byproducts of the bones, wherever, that, where this disease resides and <clears throat> making dog food out of it, uh, that uh, for, does not go away that uh, you feed that dog food then to your dogs and they go out and do their job in the lawn and the deer come along and, and graze in your front yard like they do on all of us. And they then in turn pick up that, uh, that disease. Uh, there was a discussion. They said, well, we, we cook all of that and, and that cures it. And the gentleman said, no, it has to go up to a thousand some degrees in order to, uh, kill the uh, disease, and by that time, any uh, uh, residue or byproduct would be nothing but ashes. So, uh, I, I think this uh, the, the bill we do not need for the simple reason: if we're interested in controlling the spread of uh, CWD, then we should uh, should not allow uh, the feeding of these byproducts. Uh, back in dog food. If we don't care about it, the CWD being spread, well, then I guess it doesn't make any difference. But I certainly do oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ch or Representative Cass. Representative Freeman. I'd just like to uh, ask Mr. King if this bill was to pass, could you still uh, have rules and regulations to where that you don't have? Um, um, carcasses coming from uh, uh, Chairman Driscoll's ranch going into Tewinna County. Uh, the way that I've been, testimony that I've heard and understood is, is most of the chronic wasting disease is on the Eastern side of the state. To bring it all the way to the Western part of the state gives me some, some, some cause for concern. So back to my basic question is, is can you still have rules and regulations to, to limit the control of, of disease? Mr. King. Yes, Representative Flitner, Representative Freeman, that's a, that's a great question. And so as this bill is currently written, it still would provide the Game and Fish Commission the ability to uh, continue on with the CWD transport regulations that we have in place right now. And so right now those regulations are specific to deer, elk and moose carcasses. Those are the uh, carcasses that we have a CWD concern uh, with. And right now our, our transport regulations allow for the transport of those carcasses across the state as long as they, um, as long as the head and the spinal column, the central nervous tissue where CWD is concentrated, ends up in an approved landfill or is incinerated. So um, long answer to your, to your question that the bill would currently allow the commission to continue to implement those regulations that would, uh, help prevent the spread of CWD. Mr. King, do you have any idea what the cost might be in terms of enforcement or regulation of this if there if this were to pass and someone were to create a facility like this? Yes, Representative Flittner. So that, that's a good question. And I, I don't have a, an exact cost estimate to give you. I, a lot of the, I, the responsibility for uh, documenting that the head and spinal column ended up in an approved landfill or an incinerator, I think would fall to the, the person that's in this rendering business. And then of course we would have a uh, responsibility to ensure that uh, ensure enforcement of that provision. So certainly there would be some cost and manpower involved for us, but I, I, I can't give you an exact dollar amount. Okay, thank you. Mr. Brody, did you have a comment? Yeah, Madam Chairman, if I may, I just wanted to add that um, in my reading of the law, I believe the products that would be generated under this bill um, could qualify as commercial feed under uh, the Department of Ag's jurisdiction. Um, as a result, there would be registration requirements, labeling requirements, um, other associated regulatory um, steps that would have to be conducted um, through that agency. So I just wanted to bring that to the attention of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brody. Senator James. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so we got to look at the fact that this will help the private sector expand and bring in extra revenue to the state, which we are in dire need of at this point in time in the state. 
And also I attended uh, this task force meeting as well. And they specifically said that they've been researching CWD for about 30 to 40 years and they know very little about it. And they do know that it is in, like Mr. King said, deer, elk, and moose. And the lifespan of this, they tend to live a very long time. Uh, so it doesn't really affect them as drastically as it's being um, put out there. Also, uh, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't transfer to humans. It doesn't transfer to other animals. So we don't need to worry about that. There's been plenty of studies on that part. So we don't have to worry about transferring to humans. He also stated that as long as we take out the brain and the spinal cord, then we don't have to worry about it in that aspect. So, and he also said it'd be up to the uh, person doing the rendering to take care of that. So there's plenty of things here to uh, take a lot of concern out and to help the state. So speaking in favor of this bill, this will be very beneficial in all aspects. So thank you. Chairman Driscoll. I like I've got a kind of two problem one and it's of absolute critical this is going into feed that's labeled under department of ag and particularly livestock feed i think we're heading down a dangerous path they've banned that type of stuff for a long time and if you want to decimate wyoming's second or third largest industry have an outbreak of of basically mad cow disease because of a rendered part and I'd like some answers if this is going to go in, be able to go into livestock feed because it changes very dramatically where I fall on the bill. The second part of the question goes back to the game and fishes. What exactly is your procedure when you hit a CWD positive with a hunter? Because for the second year in a row, we've been notified that we've had CWD deer off our place and I think they're pretty lackadaisical what they do with the hunters as far as notifying them. I'd like to know the process. Representative elect or I'll let you uh, speak first and then we'll go to Mr. King. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, th this is, um, you know, the, the discussion has been about doing this for dog food. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that his intention is not to make this available for anything other than that. So I think that's one thing that needs to be cleared uh, or clarified is that th this is not something where they are looking to develop a product that will go back into livestock. Nobody wants that. That, that would be highly risky to do that. Uh, but as Senator James said, the, uh, the fact that it, it, it hasn't been able to jump from one species to another, but uh, we, we definitely wouldn't want to see that going into livestock. Um, but the, the other point that I'd like to make is, you know, as, as Senator Driscoll said, we got all these deer that are hit, that are laying dead on the road. There's all kinds of things that are gonna scavenge those animals. So the idea that, that just leaving it, uh, you know, deals with the problem. I think it, it's actually a better process to, to, to utilize that resource that, that's sitting on the side of the highway. Uh, as rep, as uh, Mr. King mentioned, you know, we already know if, if, if you separate the, the, the brain and the spinal column, that's where the CWD uh, vector is going to be. And so it, to me, th this is kind of, uh, you know, a question that you need to decide. Is it better to clean that stuff up and, and, and remove that stuff rather than leaving it on the side of the road where things are going to scavenge it and you are going to spread the, the CWD? If it goes into dog food, it's primarily going to be going to residential areas. Uh, you know, it's, it's there, there, obviously there could be some people in the rural community that, that feed their dogs this stuff, but, you know, by and large, I think it's removing it uh, off of the landscape and putting it in a usable form that that's probably better off. But, but that's, you know, something I think 
there, there's so many unknowns about CWD that, you know, we can get down in the weeds and, and uh, lose sight of the, the purpose of this bill. This bill is to allow a business to expand, to develop a product being dog food that can allow them to expand their, the, the, the amount of business that they can do. So I, I would ask the committee to consider that uh, and, and understand that uh, if there needs to be something put in place that says it can't be uh, <clears throat> fed to livestock, that's not the intent. Uh, so if you need to put something like that in the bill, uh, that, that's not going to cause any trouble. But uh, either way, I, I think the point is that ag will be, <clears throat> excuse me, that the ag department will still be uh, monitoring what is produced and how it's uh, utilized. So keep that in mind, if you would. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I know we're kind of venturing off topic when we talk about um, Chairman Driscoll's um, dead animals, we're, we're talking about roadkill and that's not what we're talking about with this piece of legislation. Mr. King, did you have a, a response as well? Uh, Chairman Flitner, uh, Co-Chairman Driscoll, I, I'll, just to back up, I'll answer uh, Chairman Driscoll's uh, question about game and fish and CWD testing. So right now when a sample is collected, we send it to our lab in Laramie and they, they process it and test it for chronic wasting disease. If it, if it comes back positive, we, we post those results on our website and the hunter has a, a code that then they can go to our website, enter their code and it'll provide the results back to the hunter. The advice that we've given to hunters that have an animal that comes back positive is to not consume it. That's, that's based on uh, CDC guidelines and we allow for the disposal of that carcass in, a, in an approved landfill. So um, hopefully that answers your, your question about uh, the game and fish testing and, and our response. Um, the one other thing that I'll mention just, just quickly is that, uh, so uh, the, the prion is, the, the prion, that's the protein that causes chronic wasting disease. It is concentrated in the central nervous system, the, the brain and the spinal column, but it can be fi found in other parts of the body, for example, the lymph nodes. And so um, through, through research, we, we do know that that prion can pass through the digestive tract of a coyote and still be viable. Um, so I, I suspect that it would be the same with a dog. And, and I, I just bring that up for, for informational purposes only. Thank you, Mr. King. Representative Cass, did you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, the, the idea that this bill <clears throat> is going to produce a new industry or something that's going to be year round, I, I, I don't see that as happening. Uh, it is the bill addresses for, for game animals, which is during the dispose of the unedible parts during hunting season, mainly. Yes, you're talking about picking up roadkill, but uh, the processing plants. Uh, that I am familiar with, they process wild game during the hunting season, and most of them pretty well shut down their domestic beef processing because they have to segregate wild game from their meat, uh, from their domestic beef, etc. And so uh, to say that they uh, will be processing roadkill, if you will, uh, during the rest of the year when they're in the business of processing beef and sheep and pork, I don't think that even would be allowed to have that kind of product mixed in with what they're doing uh, and continue with their domestic beef processing. So we're talking about something that would help them dispose this uh, byproduct during hunting season. I could see that there might be advantage, but it, I don't think the benefits uh, will out, outweigh the risk of of moving this uh, prion around and, and spread uh, spreading the chance of the disease. Uh, it's we're allowing proposing to allow something that we really don't need. Uh, yes, I can see where it, it would hurt uh, help some of these uh, processing plants during the their uh, season that they're handling the game. Uh, but as far as selling it as, yeah, this is a new industry that they can do year round, I, I sure would question that. So thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Representative elect Wharf, did you have a comment or a question? Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, I, I would just like to respond because the way it works right now, when, when you process a game animal, all, all that stuff that, that is left that they want to be able to use to, to render into this product, it goes into the landfill. And there's so many producers across the state, all that product, rather than going to the landfill, it, it, it can be stored and it can be brought up after the hunting season when all the, the game animals are no longer available, but you got all this waste rather than put it in the landfill, it can then be collected. Uh, if, if somebody wants to do that, they could go collect the waste from all the other places rather than it going to the landfill and, and utilize it. Uh, it. It's as simple as all they'd have to do is separate the, the, the brain and the spinal co column and that stuff can all go to the, the landfill as, as it state requires today. But all the, the remaining parts that could be utilized could be gathered up and it could be. I mean, you think about just the sheer volume of stuff that we're sending to the landfill that could be put into a usable product that can provide jobs and opportunities in the state. Uh, there, there may be other places that are interested in rendering. It might just not be in my county. But I, I think there's ample supply for this to, to provide opportunity for people. So uh, we, we have the option. We can throw it all in the landfill or we can make it into usable product that benefits people. So with that, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Co-Chairman Miller. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair-elect. Uh, a question for uh, Representative-elect Wharf is, do we have a, a guesstimate of the, the, the volume or the amount of pounds we're talking about on an annual basis? Are we talking 10,000 pounds, a million pounds, uh, 100,000 pounds? What, what number have you done on uh, back of the envelope? And, and maybe Mr. Kemp wants to chime in on this also. Thank you. Representative-elect Wharf. Yeah, Madam Chair, I, I see that Ben Kemp is is on, and I, I would probably defer that question to him if that's uh, uh, amenable to you. Okay. Mr. Kemp, are you re ready to answer questions? I am, Madam Chair, and I apologize if I don't do this exactly how uh, you, you handle this. I'm still fairly new at uh, how this uh, process works, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. The answer to the question is, is there is a substantial amount of waste uh, that uh, that ends up in the landfill. Uh, you know, just looking at our operation here, it's tens of thousands of pounds. Um, and uh, across the state, I would, I would dare submit you're in the million pounds or more um, with all of the processors. Now, I can't speak for all of the other ones. Uh, I don't know their business or their operation, but uh, uh, we're talking, I, I would say, in excess of a million pounds. So, Mr. Kemp, what would be your intention? And what, I guess, I'm just curious as to if you were to expand on, on what you're doing presently and, and move into the dog food business, what would that look like for you in terms of... Um, um, you know, expanding your operations and, and your costs involved and how would you see your end product um, that you would end up selling to your clientele? Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, um, so in answer to that question, um, we, because uh, we're a seasonal operation, it's very difficult to, to, and I apologize, I'm running a business here and the phone's ringing, apologize. But uh, we, uh, we're a seasonal business and it's hard to find uh, seasonal help uh, for those two and a half, three months a year. What this would allow for us to do is to open up to a year round operation uh, and be able to hire year round help uh, with uh, benefits and uh, both health benefits as well as, uh, you know, uh, full time work. Um, the dog food industry is is growing substantially. Um, Hold on, I need to mute this. It's probably your fans calling to say they're watching you on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, something like that. I've got people that are answering the phone in the shop, but they're not hearing it, so I apologize. But uh, um, so so because we we have the ability to operate now year round, 
um, it's huge for our operation and our business uh, to be able to grow and uh, and and uh, recognize, I think, uh, uh, a substantial amount of income that uh, we're presently not, or revenue that we're not presently able to do. Uh, we shut down for seven, eight months a year. Um, as it sits right now and this building sits vacant, uh, we would be able to uh, to now keep the doors open and, and uh, keep people employed. So Mr. Kemp, I'm just curious then, would there be storage involved? Because you wouldn't be able to process, I mean, if you were gathering up um, leftover or the waste, so to speak, from um, hunters, um, how, I, I'm just wondering how this would play out. Uh, yes, there is a, a cold storage involved. I mean, our, our hope would be during the hunting season that we would just take those uh, those scraps rather than uh, send them to the landfill. They would go right into the processing of uh, the dog treats. Um, but uh, um, but ultimately, because of the quantities, uh, we would probably keep them in cold storage uh, for a period of time until we can process those. So we would have to improve our uh, facility uh, here at the uh, our location to be able to take care of that cold storage. Thank you. Representative Haley. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairman-Elect. Uh, I have a couple questions, I guess it would be to uh, uh, Chief Game Warden King and to Mr. Kemp. Uh, one is, it's my understanding that Utah has regulations uh, regarding the, the transportation of like deer, elk and moose that, that could carry the CWD. And another question for Mr. King would be, does cooking this kill any of the prions or all of them or the temperatures? We've heard various things. And uh, I'm concerned because of the uh, possibility of increasing CWD in these other, in herds, in the numbers of animals in these herds, because these prions are not found only in the spinal cord and the brain. As you know, we used to take lymph nodes out to, to test them. And for Mr. Kemp, um, why don't you go around, since you got to store wildlife, why don't you go around to meat processors in Albany County? The uh, I talked to one of them. They have no interest in doing this at all. And so there would be a source. They, they butcher a lot of pigs and lambs and beef. Why don't you gather up that that's already legal and store it and employ these people on a year-round basis? I guess you already have a product that's there. And you don't have to uh, create a new law to address it. And then uh, just one side note is we've had a roadkill bill for years before I got in the legislature and we had it two years when I was in it and killed it five or six times. So that ought to be a, sorry, Chairman Driscoll, <laughs> but uh, we've, we've killed that, that bill for various reasons, um, good reasons. So if I get answers to those questions, uh, I'll shut up. Thank you. Uh, Chief King, we'll go to you first, please. Sure, thank you, uh, Representative Flitner and uh, Representative Haley. So to first address the rendering process. So the rendering process would not deactivate that prion, the CWD prion. So it, it takes extremely high temperatures. It would take temperatures at the incinerator level to deactivate that prion. Uh, so the rendering process, just normal normal cooking and rendering wouldn't deactivate the prion. Uh, your, your second question about transport. So uh, there's been a lot of work both within Wyoming and regionally and, and at the national level to address CWD. It's a, it's a concern at a national level. And so there's been a, uh, an effort to make sure that, that states have uh, regulations in place to pre prevent the uh, transport of uh, wildlife parts that could have CWD in them. And so, for example, our regulations that prohibit 
the transport of certain wildlife parts out of the state are very similar to what Utah has. And, and Utah's um, regulations, uh, they, they don't allow um, meat or, or certain parts, they, they allow edible portions of game meat from other states to come into the state, but they're, they're very specific as to what they allow into their state um, if it comes from a state that's known positive for CWD. So um, just like us, they don't allow the import of uh, uh, certain parts of wildlife from CWD positive places. Thank you. And Mr. Kemp, to answer the second question for Representative Haley, please. Yes, Representative Flitner and Representative Haley. Um, so in answer to the second question, um, the reason we don't uh, contract with uh, domestic uh, slaughterhouses or processing facilities is because we're in the wild game processing arena. We, we process wild game. We, uh, we enjoy what we do. We love what we do. And we feel like it's a necessary um, um, venture uh, to take care of uh, the sportsman and hunting population to uh, process the game for or the animals for them. Um, and and uh, there, there are other reasons. Uh, we, the, the market that we target uh, are uh, individuals that uh, uh, we have both pet parents and, and uh, pet owners, and uh, we appeal to both of those, but they're looking for a uh, maybe a superior quality product uh, with reference to a uh, wild uh, game that's uh, all natural, uh, not exposed to GMOs or pesticides, etc. And so uh, we found, uh, found that to be a very successful venture um, as well, you know, and, and a worthwhile cause uh, to appeal to that the all natural market. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, Representative Haley, but uh, uh, we're just not in that uh, domestic market as far as taking those scraps. There are other uh, companies that do that. Uh, and as far as uh, the wild game uh, transportation, if I could just address that really quickly, um, it, my understanding uh, that is that uh, it is the, uh, the the brain matter and the spinal column that, the spinal column that cannot be transported across state lines. We we are right on the Utah Wyoming border, and we process animals uh, for both um, both states. And uh, uh, one of the uh, things that we have had to do, and we work with the local game and fish, is to make sure that both the spinal cord and the uh, and the brain tissue goes directly to the uh, landfill and doesn't leave our facility. And we do a really good job of that. Uh, as far as the edible portions, uh, they're transporting across state lines all of the time. And these are the, in essence, uh, the, the question, well, it, what is the definition of edible? Um, these are certainly, uh, this portion that comes off is just a uh, not as palatable, but it is uh, by definition edible. Uh, we could eat it if we chose to. We just don't particularly care for the, the way that it would taste or more importantly, the, uh, um, you know, the texture of it. Uh, so these are the portions of what is arguably edible meat that gets thrown away in the landfill that we're talking about the ability to either market and sell or transport across state lines. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kemp. Um, committee, further questions? Representative Elect Wharf. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'll just be real brief, but I, I think it's important. We, we've had a lot of discussion and, and there are definitely ways that this bill could be amended, expanded, whatever. But I want the committee to really look at the bill and what it does, because we've had a lot of discussions that, that aren't germane to the bill uh, and I, I just would ask the committee to look at the bill and at what it actually does. So with that, thanks for your time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Worf. Uh, Senator James. Thank you, Madam Chair. We also need to take a look at a couple other things. One, government needs to get out of the way of private sector and give them the opportunity to expand and allow them to provide a service for the people and right now they have a product out there that isn't being utilized so we need to give them that opportunity and that's a big point right there 
And two, CWD cannot be uh, brought over to dogs. That's been proven time and time again. And they have a way to separate the brain and spinal cord. So we need to pay attention to those very important facts. Thank you. Thank you, Senator James. So committee, what is your pleasure? Senator and Stanley Dalton. Move the bill. Second. Second from Senator James. So moved by Anselmi Dalton, second by Senator James. So forgive me, um, uh, is this just a, do we need a roll call vote on this? Or is this just a, a eyes or nays? Probably eyes, Chairman Driscoll. Uh, eyes, nays, but did you ask for public comment? Did we have any left? I'm not sure we. Oh, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have any public comment? Chairman Miller, did you have a comment? Just to follow up, uh, Representative Flitner is uh, also, uh, you know, we're on the bill, it's been moved. There may be some amendments by some of the people here. Uh, so go, go there first, uh, and then, uh, then we can go to public comment. Thank okay. you. Good job. Well, thanks. Thanks for throwing me under the bus. Really appreciate it. Um, so let's, we'll go we'll through this and we'll see on page one, do we have any amendments? Page two, any amendments? All right. And Mary Beth, do we have any, or John, do we have any public comment, Mr. Brody? Uh, Madam Chair elect, uh, there is no other um, public comment. Okay. Well, it's been moved and seconded. Representative Freeman. I was just wondering if we were going to have any comments by committee members. Does anybody have a comment or a question? Did you, I, have, I have a comment. When I saw this, when I read it through, um, I, I thought I, I was pretty comfortable with it. Um, and I want to do anything that I can to... Uh, uh, to give comfort to somebody who wants to set up business. Um, but I keep coming back to the statement that uh, was made at the beginning of this discussion is, is that uh, through rules and regulations from the Game and Fish Department, that uh, a lot of what uh, is contained in the bill can be, can be achieved. Uh, it's a lot easier to change rules and regulations um, than it is to change a bill. And I, I've finally fell on the, um, on, on the side that I'm gonna vote against the bill because I think with all the stuff that we've gone in, uh, that we've talked about, kind of brings up doubts. And I think that it'd be a lot better if the, um, if the Game and Fish, which is much more fluid than the legislature, uh, was allowed to handle this. Uh, again, I want to uh, uh, see a new business or expand a business but I don't think this is the avenue to do it. Representative Winter, I would suspect you might have a comment on this, do you? Uh, th thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I guess the, my concern here is uh, the CWD, uh, the disease itself, and I, I don't think we've answered many questions regarding that. Uh, to my way of thinking, maybe the state of Wyoming should come up with some kind of a incinerator to accommodate, accommodate the problem of CWD. Uh, I I don't think we want to stifle, stifle any of these uh, businesses in any way if, if we can help them out uh, with this rendering situation. So. I think there's two different issues here. Uh, the way the uh, the bill is written, it looks pretty good to me, and I I think we should uh, move it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Winter. Representative Haley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess as far as expanding business, if if um, these operators are serious about that. I guess I, I don't understand what the objection to rendering what's already legal so they could provide this 
the, the added employment stay open to the year round and, and have more accessibility to uh, products to render. And, and then the other concern I have is, is the CWD concern. And until we get that under control, I just, it's to me, this rendering just like the roadkill bill, it just needs to die. And so I'll be voting against this. Thank you. Senator James, did you have a brief comment or a question? I had a quick comment in response to Representative Freeman and now Representative Haley. Um, in regards to the Game and Fish uh, establishing rules and regulations, if they've been able to do it this entire time, why haven't they? So it's time that we do bring a bill since they haven't acted on it. Uh, and in regards to the CWD, they've been studying this for 30 to 40 years. And they've done plenty of studies to show that it can't cross over to dogs. So that's not an issue. Um, I don't know. I mean, if he's really that concerned about it, then he should read the studies. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it's been proven time and time again that it doesn't cross over to other species. So, and that's not gonna be fed to deer and elk and moose, it's gonna be fed to dogs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator James. I would suspect that uh, Warden Haley's probably read an awful lot on chronic wasting over the course of his tenure. Representative Tass. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Again, uh, just a short response. Uh, uh, yes, it doesn't uh, cross over to where dogs would have the disease themselves. What it does is the dogs can pack it and scatter it uh, to areas where uh, maybe there it isn't already in the ground and in the grasses. So uh, to feed this to your pets and your dogs that would continue spreading uh, the uh, pyron uh, around different areas that probably it wouldn't get there if it wasn't fed to their pets. So I uh, definitely oppose the bill. Thank you. We have further, Chairman Miller. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, several comments. One, I don't think this is a, uh, a big economic development issue. It's, it's really just a minor thing. Uh, but you know, the, the fact that we, 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 we build these fences or these roadblocks to people trying to think of new ideas of how to make things happen, uh, that's, that's where I have a problem with us getting in the way of this. So I'm going to vote aye so this bill can move forward. Hopefully, uh, the committee during the session can, uh, can work the bill. Uh, you're going to have, what, eight times for amendments on this for the game and fish to come in. And frankly, uh, I, I think if this did result in spreading or someone uh, getting uh, that particular disease, the processor is going to be somewhat liable for it. So I think we, we, we throw it back and, and, and let these folks work it out and uh, make sure it's safe. And, uh, you know, they're going to assume the liability if it's not safe. So uh, on and for the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions? Representative Winner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, it was my understanding that in order to do this rendering, uh, that those parts that are affected by the CWD would not be involved in that. Uh, talking about the brain and the spinal cord. So did I miss something here? Um, Representative Winter, no, I believe you're right. You're correct. Further questions or comments from anybody? Representative Winter, did you want to follow up? Yes, ma'am, I, I would. Uh, uh, so I, if those parts are not being involved in this, uh, in the rendering, uh, so what is the problem here with this bill? I don't understand that. I think that's more of a hypothetical, but Representative Elect would, uh, Worf, would you like to speak to that? Madam, Madam Chair, um, I, I would. I didn't know if it's appropriate for me to comment. I'm kind of wearing two different hats today, but uh, you know that I, I do think, as they pointed out, you know that there is some in the lymph nodes, uh, but 
I would venture to bet that, you know, it, it's going to be minimal as compared to what's in the spinal cord and in the, the brain. But I, I did want to respond to what uh, Representative Haley said about how he, he thought it's easier, more adaptable to put it in rules and regs. I, I want to make it clear the committee understands that's the problem. You're asking somebody to, to spend all this money developing more cold storage space and, and making plans. And if it's in just rules and regs, it can be changed tomorrow on a whim. And so when you're talking about a business, stability is important. When you're going to start spending money, capital, developing that business, that's why we brought this bill forward is because it's too risky of a venture if it's left in rules and regs. That's, that's the only reason why we brought this bill forward to put it in statute so that the business has some assurity that they can develop that business. So I just want to clarify that, Madam Chair, and I'll, I'll be done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Worf. For the questions or comment committee, I cannot see any senators on my screen. Are they, I don't know if it's because, oh, you know, Senator, other than Senator elect or Senator Anselmi Dalton and Senator James, but Senator Anselmi Dalton, did you have a question or a comment? Um, one, I just want to let you know I was here, but second, um, I did have a quick comment, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, you're doing a great job on the fly. Just proud of you there. First of all, I want to throw that out. And uh, with a little humor and everything, good job. Um, for me, I'm going to be a yes on the bill. I know I'm, I'm not going to be here next, but I think the, the, uh, the problems can be worked out and it's a, a chance to maybe assess what we can do with these animals. Uh, as Chairman Driscoll noted, he has a lot of them laying by the side of his road. It'd be better if we could get these businesses to become established in different places and uh, work out a system and perhaps get rid of some of ultimately even the roadkill um, as long as it wasn't for agricultural purposes as chairman driscoll noted um so i will be a yes but i wish you all good luck on <laughs> figuring it out as you move forward thank you senator and chairman ellis i saw you briefly did you have a comment uh thank you madam chair just more questions um you know we talk about uh you know, who's liable down the road. I think that that probably will be a bigger conversation. I'm curious to know if other states do this. And then as far as the labeling on the package, just so that those uh, dog owners that maybe don't feel com as comfortable or as assured um, with feeding this product to their animals, if they're going to be made aware um, that whatever they're buying in the store might contain this. Um, so those are just questions I have, but I know I'm not a committee member yet. Um, so things to contemplate down the road if this bill continues to advance. Thank you. Further questions, comments, committee? All right, then the, the bill's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye. aye. And show your hands up, please. Madam Chairman. Mr. Brody, I'm sorry. Um, under the interim committee rules to sponsor a bill, it would require a roll call vote. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brody. So I'll let you take that then. Okay, uh, Mary Beth will actually be taking that vote. Um, just a reminder for the committee, when you adopted your interim rules, you did adopt the rule that it requires a majority of each house in order to officially act. So I just wanted to, uh, I guess, remind the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is a roll call vote on 21 LSO 246 version four, Senator Anselmi Dalton. Aye. Senator James. Aye. Senator Monmees. He looked proxy a no vote to me. Senator Wasberger. He did not leave a vote, excused. Representative Flitner. Aye. Representative Freeman. No. Representative Haley? No. Representative Knapp? Excuse me. He's probably in that training. We will hold the vote open for Knapp until the end of the meeting and, and same for Wasperger if that's okay with co chairman. Mm -hmm. Representative Newsom? Aye. Uh, Representative Tass? No. 
Representative Winter. Aye. Representative Yin. Excused. Co-Chairman Miller. Aye. Co-Chairman Driscoll. Aye. Where do we stand on the votes now? We, we'll leave it open one way or the other, but where, where do we stand on the votes now? Mr. Chairman, just give me one second to tally. Perfect, sorry. Mr. Chairman, that, would, that bill passes as it stands right now. I have seven yes, four no, three excused. Do you have a problem, Co-Chairman, to leave the vote open? I know Senator Wasserberger will be back, and I am suspicious that I would like Representative Knapp to be able to cast his first vote if he comes back on. Chairman Miller, I, I have no problem with that. I'm good also. Thank you. Oh, we, we, now where do we go? We are way ahead of schedule. That's really unheard of with this committee. Madam Chair? Senator Dalton. I have a question um, for Mary Beth. Or, um, if it is, it's the majority and we have seven, four, and three excused, unless we get their votes, don't they count as no if they're excused? Or how does that count? I just wanted to make sure we're doing it correctly. Good question. Mary Beth. Mr. Chairman, I, I um, Senator Anselmi Dalton, I will uh, defer to John Brody and he can explain that to you. Thank you. I think I can. I've been around long enough and I think Representative Miller has a co-chairman Miller as well. Chairman has a prerogative till the end of the meeting to leave a vote held open. That was why I asked him and when that's the case, those people can vote as they go and the vote's closed at the end of the day at the meeting. Uh, it's not unusual to happen in, in interim meetings. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, um, Madam Chair, um, I was just curious more, right, I agree that it could be kept open. I just wanted to say, we said it was passing, but it was really 7-7, seven, seven, wasn't it? If Unless we get these other votes. And so I just wanted to make sure that I was correct on understanding where we are presently. Presently, we have a majority I vote for both the representatives and the senators b before those um, who are absent vote. Correct, Mr. Brody? Uh, Madam Chairman, so actually what it would be is the, the quorum is the members present and then a majority vote of those present. So if somebody has uh, been excused from attendance for today, for example, um, Representative Knapp because he's a new legislator training, uh, the fact that he's not here would not count him as a no vote. Thank you. That's what I was asking. Thank you. And Mr. Brody, uh, regarding uh, Representative Yin, did he, or Chairman Miller, did he leave a vote with you? He did not. He did not leave a vote, but he's excused, obviously. He notified us that uh, he was uh, leaving the, the state for a few days. So, uh, yes, he's excused, and he did not leave a vote. Thank you. Well, our next um, topic of discussion is lunch, and we're an hour ahead of lunchtime, so we can, uh, Mr. Co-Chairman Driscoll, Chairman Miller, what's your pleasure? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe John or Mary Beth could see if we could come back in a little bit earlier then one o'clock, if they can get the uh, Gaming Commission folks uh, queued up. Uh, Co-Chair Driscoll, what, what do you think of that? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, I'm in full agreement. I think particularly the first gaming bill is kind of a, a cleanup revision bill that I don't think is quite of the same importance. So we could come in earlier, assuming they could make themselves available, perhaps do a little longer lunch. But we've got a heavy lift this afternoon with gaming and and the trapping. So it'd be nice if we could start a little earlier after lunch, possibly. Miss, Mr. Chairman, 
Um, I do have the Wyoming Gaming Commission um, on standby. However, um, there are a couple of um, council, council, uh, Councilman Fast Horse and a couple other members that won't be able to attend until after 1230. So um, I wouldn't advise coming back before then just if you want to hear from them. I think 1230 would be very appropriate to go from now till 1230. That suit you, co-chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. I'm wondering if the Game and Fish Department, can we jump our, can we put them above uh, gaming? If well, they were. I think you're going to have a problem with folks that want to public comment. Yeah. Right. The grounds and the, uh, the trapping. So. We know we've got a lot on, on the trapping. I think the feed ground's going to bring some comments as well. I've had some calls. So, uh, Madam Co-Chair-Elect, <laughs> why don't we shoot for 1230? Okay, committee, does that work for you? Okay, we'll be ready uh, when we come back in and we have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of public comment in the second half of our day. So um, bear that in mind in terms of uh, questions and comments, if we could kind of keep ourselves under containment too. It'll make the day go a lot faster. See you after lunch. Very good, thank you.